being said, it's going to be it's going to be recorded. Uh, the uh, point of this lecture is to share what I've learned throughout my research experience in regards to scientific imaging. Some of these slides will have quite a lot of text within them. Uh, I would like to invite you to not go through every single one and read them in detail as it will be recorded and you'll be able to view them at a later date and post the video to read all the text. That said, uh, this presentation is divided into two separate uh, parts. The first part will be photography and digital processing. So we'll go through the process of how to take artifact for photographs, various tricks and tips to do the best job possible. And the second part will be specifically about illustration and design with a focus with illustration creation for scientific publications. So starting with photography and digital processing, it is a very broad field and there are many different ways of doing it. But the way I've divided this part is into two separate sections. The first one looking specifically at the photography part of it, the action going from physical to the digital aspect. And then we'll quickly look at how to process digitally images. So to create clear figures, but yet not losing resolution. So before starting with the information, it's important to take into consideration the role that photography has in scientific literature. And it's important to distinguish the aspects of subjectivity and objectivity and fiction versus nonfiction. Because of course, since this aspect of photography has to be for the spreading of knowledge, we have to be as objective and nonfiction as possible, trying to keep true the information. However, Sometimes when we think of pretty things, we think of them as being fictional or very creative, but pretty does not mean non-scientific. And we'll go through a variety of little tricks and uh, ideas that could make figures look more pleasant to the eye, yet keeping it as objective as humanly possible. So when we start with photography, of course, the very start of it is how to handle a camera. And although this might seem obvious at first, it is something that's important to take into account. So of course, when we take photos of artifacts, for example, in a lab, a tripod will usually be available. But if not, either in a lab or in the field, camera should be gripped properly using both hands and stabilizing the whole body. Once we manage to hold the camera properly, we have to know what is in the camera. So. Row sizes and types of sensors is a really important thing to take into account. These are in the case we're using a reflex camera, hence not a digital one. But in such cases, usually all the cameras we have available of any kind will work one way or another for artifact photography. The most important thing when dealing with cameras and photographing artifacts are the lenses. So just to give a general description, a lens is the object that filters and focuses the light so that it hits the sensor or the film in a specific way. There are two different types of lenses, prime lenses, which are fixed, so you cannot change the focal length. They're much faster and sharper to use, but they don't have the possibilities that zoom lenses have, which are flexible. They are bigger and heavier, but they give you the possibility to zoom throughout various focal lengths. And zoom lenses, in fact, are usually what are most commonly used as artifacts can be of different sizes, different types, and one single prime lens wouldn't work for different types of artifacts. So once you'll be able to uh, have a camera, put it properly on a tripod or hold it properly, and you have a lens, the first function for the camera that you'll have to take into account is the depth of field. This is simply what is in focus. And this varies depending on the focal length and the maximum aperture. The focal length is the measurement or the distance between the point of convergence of the lens has where the light converges within it and the sensor of the camera. This is a very important measurement and you'll see it written on lenses all the time. For example, 35 millimeters to 50 millimeters. And by changing the focal length, you'll be able to focus at different points from the lens. And a smaller number will give you a wider angle of view, a larger number will give you a narrower angle of view. This is important for artifacts, 
because you'll need to focus at different points, especially depending on how far it is. Just to give you a visual cue of what focal lengths look like on the lower part, you'll see different focal lengths in millimeters and the corresponding angles of views. So apart from setting up the focal length on a camera, of course, you'll have to set up also an aperture. And this is simply the opening, the size of the opening on a lens, hence how much light comes in from the outside. This is expressed in f-stops and they're counterintuitive, meaning a larger opening, hence a larger aperture will give you a smaller, shallower depth. And these are all things that, as you can see here, uh, as I said, are counterintuitive, but by experimenting and taking some experience from it, you'll be able to work with them fairly easily and quickly. Aperture, therefore, depends on the context, on the amount of ambient or environmental light, on the color of the artifact you're trying to portray. But it's always important to take into account, especially when selecting a lens, what the maximum aperture is. Because yes, the aperture can be adjusted. However, the maximum aperture is set for every type of lens. And of course, higher aperture means more possibilities, but the lenses with higher apertures also have higher costs. Therefore, it's always better to start from an in-between position, therefore trying out photography with the equipment you have, and then possibly going up in aperture in this case, if the environment requires it. So with aperture and focal length being the two main functions, you can modify them and play with them in a whole variety of ways. And every type of lens will have different degrees of play between focal length and aperture that will make the lens specifically good for different um, tasks. In this case, you can see all the different types of uh, lenses, and I'm not going to get into details for every each one of them, because the only type of lens that we're really interested in is a macro lens. So macro lens, as you can see in the lower portion, has an angle of view between 60 and 35, and it's specifically created for close-up macro photographs, meaning that you can take photographs of objects that are really close to you and having really high quality of it. And the sharp image is what we're really interested in specifically for artifacts. So ideally you'll have a macro lens, you'll have a camera where you can adjust uh, aperture and focal length and experimenting again is key to have the best outcome. But there are also other digital functions to play with that will make you have a better photograph. The first one is ISO, and it's basically the light sensitivity of the, of the sensor. This is digitally adjusted. It goes from zero to 1200 or even more. And the higher ISO makes the sensor more, more sensitive to light. Therefore, in low light conditions, you'll be able to bring up the ISO to have a better view of the photograph or the object. However, by having more light or the sensor catch more light, you'll have an image that's, that's much noisier. And this is something that usually we do not want with artifact photographs. The last thing that we do uh, control digitally is exposure. Exposure, as you can see in the center, is a setting that can have either positive or negative values. And it's a dig digital value that puts together the time, therefore, for how long the sensor catches the image, the aperture, and the ISO and basically just gives you a lighter image going into the positive numbers or a darker or dimmer image going into the negative values. These are all things that uh, are not a perfect science. They're dependent on variables that most of the times, if not always, we can't control. Even the smaller differences in uh, lighting that could change from within five minutes of a room that's well lit will mean that you have to change the settings even just by a little bit to get the best result. But experimentation is key. 
And now that we've seen more or less the functions for photographs, it's also important to understand not only how the camera is set, but also how the image itself, the photograph, will be recorded within it. And this is important because different file formats, as in raster and vector, can be recorded in different manners. For photographs, we're specifically dealing with rasters, and more will be discussed about the difference between the two later on. But rasters are basically constructed by pixels. And the main issue with this is that any manipulation of it, any manipulation we do either within the camera or in post-processing softwares will cause distortion of the image. And this is what we don't want, especially for scientific publications. Therefore, it is extremely important to save the photographs you want to take at the exact dimensions that you desire. This means the dimensions of the image you want to take has to be set within the camera itself before exporting it or even before taking the picture as taking, for example, an image that is too small and then bringing it to a computer and enlarging it will mean that you'll lose resolution. There are different types of image file formats from the more compressed, therefore the, uh, the ones that have the lowest resolution such as JPEGs and PNGs to the better quality ones such as TIFF that has a so-called lossless compression. But ideally when you're taking photos of artifacts, you'll always want to choose raw image formats. These depend on the uh, brand of the camera you have. Sometimes they're called raw, sometimes CR2 and so on. And they are absolutely the least processed images. The only issue is that they are the images that um, are the heaviest of, of all. Therefore, you'll need quite a lot of memory. You'll need quite a lot of capacity to work with them. And the processing will also take a bit longer. But it's absolutely worth it for the intended uh, objective of having publications out of these images. So apart from the digital aspect, uh, going back to the more equipment side of it, uh, if we want to take images, what is more important, the camera or the lens? As a matter of fact, it's the lens, because a camera, usually nowadays, all digital cameras have basically all the basic technology we need, but lenses are what really gives us a clear, crystalline, perfect image. So when trying to choose a lens, if we can, ideally we want to keep in mind the cost, the size and weight, and the various features. Of course, if we're taking photographs in the lab versus in the field, it'll be different for each side, but lens is what we also uh, always should consider. And when putting all of this together, the various aspects we want to take into account, this is the general setup we want for the best possible outcome. In regards to the photo photography, the camera and the lens we discussed, a light box is uh, something that should always be used. Many of the times we see light boxes that are very complex or uh, fancy and big, but personally, uh, usually just a cardboard box with a hole on the top and some white paper on the walls works just as well. Lighting too is extremely important. The more controlled lighting we have, the less the ambient lighting will change and uh, give us problems with the setting of the camera. Of course, as we said, the tripod and the background, depending on the artifact that we're trying to photograph. And of course, just to summarize, the clarity of the photographs are dependent on the lighting we have, the background we have, the focus and aperture. That said, this is an example of what different backgrounds could look like. Uh, ideally, you always want to use uh, some color between white and black. Uh, the uh, lighter colors work best for darker artifacts and vice versa, although sometimes uh, specific unique colors can be used if you see that the artifact looks really good over it. Uh, to give an example, green, a green background might be used if the artifact is red in color. And it's also going to be much easier later on during the post-processing to remove the background digitally. 
in regards to the lighting, as you can see here, it's also important to play around with the light and trying different angles. As you can see from this flake, the lighting from the right gives you good imaging of the scarring of this flake. However, the uh, left side is kept dark. So what you can do is just take the photo from the other side with the light on the other side to have a good understanding of the artifact. If you wish to have a single photo with all these scars showing equally, then two lights on either end would work. So these are the basics of photography. And the next step is digital processing. And for this part, I'm just going to go through the step-by-step -step process that at least I use for producing uh, final figures for publications. There are a variety of softwares that can be used uh, for this process. These are all raster images. In this case, I will be using Photoshop, but any other software, either paid or free can be used. Uh, the only thing you'll have to do, maybe a bit of research because sometimes some of the functions have different names, but apart from that, it can be done on uh, virtually any software. As an example, I'll be using a photo I took in Nigeria of the Iho Elero Calveria. So this is a photo from a, a photogrammetry session. Uh, it's very simple. It's clean enough to be used. So what to do here? We want a single figure that can be used later on in a publication. So the very first step is white balancing. By white balancing, we make sure that every photo we use, either it's a single one, or a stack of photos has the same white color. This is usually used, um, done using a, a color coder, as you can see on the right. But if you do not have a color coder, such as in my case, you can easily click on image and adjust the curves. And as you can see in the lower left, uh, there are three little symbols for black, gray, and white. And what you do is click on the black and then automatically click on the main image on the blackest part you can see. You do the same with the gray, clicking on a gray area or a mid-tone area of the image, and then white for the lighter image. And this will automatically white balance your image. As you can see here, it's not a huge difference, but the image on the right is true to the original colors of, in this case, this Calvaria. So once you have the back, uh, the uh, white balanced, you can remove the background. Subject isolation and edge enhancements are two different steps, which help you remove the background and clean the artifact or find of your, pref uh, of your preference. However, they're really simple. Subject isolation is a three-step process. And this is how you'll select all of these. But very simply, you automatically uh, select the object you're looking for. You can adjust it at the upper left areas that you can see here. You can add or remove sections of the subject. And then all you'll have to do is layer via copy. And once that is done, you'll have automatically removed backgrounds. Next, you can, if you want, do an edge enhancement. This composed by two really simple steps, will give you the opportunity to clean the edge and make it smoother to the eye so that it's better looking, so to speak. And once you have this final image, for example, you could easily just put it on a background or include it in any composition or figure of your choice. But what you could do is do the final details and composition. Therefore, you could crop the image or a composition, you could add the background, a scale and connector and so on. And for your reference later, cropping would be accessed this way. Background is done with a simple rectangle tool on a different layer. And in this case, you can see how different background colors show the image differently. So as you, as you can see in this case, white gives problems with the edges, gray, works, but not as much as black. And this is exactly what the final figure looks like. And of course, this doesn't have a skill or anything of the kind as it was a demo. However, this is what you would expect for a final figure of this specific Alveria. 
I hope the steps are clear enough. Uh, just as photography, uh, post-processing just requires a bit of experimentation and in time it will get easier and easier. But hoping to help, this is a very quick list of tricks and tips. The one, the only one I would like to emphasize is to record every single step of the process. By this, I mean, when you start the process of digital processing, therefore, from the very first step of opening the software, make sure to keep notes of the software you use, the tools you use, the parameters, sizes, resolutions, and so on. I usually do it as a flowchart. This might take a bit more time in the post-processing. You might think you're wasting time, but at a later date, when you have to add a methodology section, for example, in the paper that will include the photographs of the figures, you'll thank yourself for it. Because it's much better to just look at a flowchart than having to think back at what you did. This is a final example of how photographs can be used in addition to composition with other non-photographic non elements. And this is exactly uh, the kind of image that can be created using both the first part of this presentation, which we've just concluded with photography, and introduces the next part, which is digital scientific illustration and design. This is a topic that I sort of started developing a while ago because I started working on different projects and um, dealing with different graphic elements. And I was realizing that there wasn't really one single uh, overarching method or perspective on how to work with archeological imaging. A lot of people worked on a lot of different methods but I tried putting it all together into one, and I hope that you'll find this useful as well. So this is divided into three different sections. So we'll start with basic vectorial design, therefore uh, how useful vector softwares can be and how they can be used, then how to compose a figure to make it as effective and successful as possible. And finally, this idea of beautifying archeology, span therefore, creating figures that are not only a great means of data communication, but at the same time are um, pleasant to look at. So as I said previously, pixels and, uh, sorry, rasters and vectors are two different image formats, which are used by different softwares. Pixels on the left, as we've already seen with photography, are what composes a raster image. They do have constraints and resolution. They're usually very big in size. However, they do allow very complex color blends and detail, detailed editing. At the same time, however, especially when we're dealing with non-photographic scientific images, we don't usually need a lot of color blends and we don't need extremely detailed edits because we're not dealing with paintings or artistic representations of figures. We're just dealing with very simple and readable images for the sake of knowledge communication. And for this specific reason, vector softwares are absolutely the best. Vectors are created by paths, which are dictated by mathematical formula. So you can see a line as being recorded within the computer, not as an object, not as pixels, but as a simple mathematical formula. This means that you can modify the formula through the software, making it as big or as little as you want without losing any resolution at all. You can save all this information while keeping the file size extremely small. But at the same time, as I said, you can't create color blends, which usually is not a problem. And it does give you very precise path editing, which will be very useful as we will see. So when dealing with vector softwares, you have a variety of uh, options at your disposal from uh, uh, ex quite expensive softwares like the Adobe packages to free to use such as Inkscape. I'll be using Illustrator in this case, but again, similarly to the previous example with photography, these are all things that can be done with any other vector software. Functions will usually simply have a different uh, name, but 
by Googling it or looking on YouTube, it'll be extremely easy to find solutions for changing software. So first of all, similar to photography, again, while in photography, you have to set up a photo image, uh, sorry, an image size with vectors, the very first thing you want to do, especially when uh, designing things for publications or scientific purposes, the first step is to set the size and number of artboards. This is really easy to do if you already have a general idea of where you would like to publish or uh, what is the specific reason you're creating the images. For example, social media, each social media platform has a set size image. Just check back at the size images and resolutions that are asked and set the artboards to that specific um, requests. The second setup is setting up the workspace. I personally suggest in, case of, in the case of Illustrator, Essentials Classic, as it has everything that's necessary without having too much. And then as we will see some basic tools and functions and the construction of a color palette. So as I previously said, Illustrator has a very simple uh, setup. This is the classic essential workspace. Therefore, you will have the basic tools, as you can see. You will have a basic object manipulation bar, and then an area with other tools and functions, which you can then uh, change at your preference. The most basic tools that I end up using all the time and that I would suggest uh, all of you getting used to if you want to learn how to use Illustrator for scientific purposes are the following. On the left, you can just see the simple tools. On the right, the actual position of them uh, within the workspace. But in the most simple terms, what you will want to use to construct an initial figure is simple lines. The best tool to do so is curvature tool. And then you'll want to work with shapes and fills and strokes. Apart from the tools you have, uh, not only in Illustrator, but in any Victoria software, you'll have different functions that will do different things. Clipping mask is a simple way to crop an image uh, by superimposing a shape of choice. Opacity is a function that's extremely useful, especially when experimenting and wanting to create something quite interesting and different. Width tool, in case you want to be a bit more creative. Arranging, again, apart from possibility of creating different layers with different objects, within the same layer, you can arrange objects in different levels. And finally, eyedropper to keep consistent coloring palettes, which is extremely important, and transforming, of course, to change images to your choice. Finally, a tool that um, I've rarely used in the past, but I've learned to use and to appreciate as Pathfinder. It's, again, not very intuitive, but you will be able to do many things and jumping a lot of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, jumping a lot of steps by just clicking one button and getting what you want done. These are all tools that at first might seem very, um, very complicated or a bit finicky, but what I would suggest is just to uh, give it a try, experiment, and if the first time doesn't work and the second time, the second time doesn't work, just try again. And as long as you have a vision in mind or you have a sketch of what you would like your final figure to look like, there is always a way to do it. it just takes time and it'll get faster and easier as you go. At the bottom, you have uh, just two very basic uh, shortcuts that I use all the time. But with all these tools, how no matter what else you want to do or how complex things you think might be, these are the only tools you'll need to create virtually anything of your choice. And apart from these technical aspects that we've seen very quickly, and I hope you'll enjoy experimenting with, um, 
the most basic rule of vector design, apart from the tools that you'll be using, is simplicity. When designing um, figures for scientific purposes, but um, most cases, at least in our case, for archaeology purposes, simplicity is the number one rule. Although we tend to add a lot of information within an image, especially because adding information in a figure means we don't have to add them in a main text, if so to, so to say. Simplicity makes images legible. It makes images easy to follow. And in many times, a simpler image speaks much more than a complicated one. Just to give another example, uh, many times, as you've seen in the previous examples, we were portraying stratigraphies, but also a simple uh, production process for tools can be portrayed in a single image with very few words, and yet it can explain the whole process from start to end without having to write a few paragraphs with words. So simplicity is something you always have to keep in mind. The second most important aspect is color palettes. The previous images were mostly in white and black, and that is what usually works best, especially for printed purposes. But if you do wish to use color palettes, always use as few colors as you can and never go over five colors. Try to keep palettes consistent between figures within the same manuscript, especially if you're dealing with the same data, just repurposed or reanalyzed in different ways. And the very first question you should always ask yourself when using color is, what does the relationship between the data do? And what do you want it to show? So colors should be used uh, to show relationships. And there are different types of color combinations. I'm not going to get into too much um, detail, but as you can see, these color combinations can be either be monochromatic or of similar color, or they can be complementary. So when thinking of the different color combinations and what you want to show with the color combinations, you might either want to show the relationship between different sets of data. As example, here we have three different curves. They are through time. They are showing data from the same region. Therefore, they're similar within type of data. They've kept the same color, but they change just by one variable. And this is what is showing with the lights, with the light and dark shades of blue. At the same time, we can use complementary colors, opposite colors, such as in blue and orange, to show how two sets of data, of data are different. At the same time, in this specific case, by using two complementary colors, we can superimpose dots that are parts of the same group as polygons, and therefore making it more legible. Another way to do it could have been, for example, to use dots and crosses, but this would have made it much more difficult to read and understand. And of course, colors, palettes, and color combinations come in many more uh, shapes and forms. They're not only monochromatic or complementary. Uh, they can be sequential, therefore meaning monochromatic from one shade to another with all the in-betweens. They can be divergent with three different hues of colors, two at the end and one in the middle, or they can be qualitative. Therefore, five completely different colors and these are used for completely different purposes. Um, these gradients are very common, especially in uh, map making and cartography. Therefore, when you'll be working in GIS, for example, uh, you'll create a map and you'll want to show some data a certain way, but you don't know how to color it. So just to give a visual perspective of this, as you can see, these show very different things. Sequential gradients, therefore, should usually be used when you want to show a specific region, a specific area, or a specific one specific variable. Therefore, see it as a binary sort of perspective. Either there is something or there is not. 
There might be a sum in between, but here this map is showing really well higher altitude areas. And this is what you might want to show. At the same time, if you want to show the differences in this case of two different altitudes, but it could be any two different variables, here we could have a valley and a high altitude area. In this case, it's really clear the distinction. You get a very good definition between the two different topographies. But at the same time, what if you wanted to show more than two uh, variables or more than two values, then of course you could use qualitative. And in this case, we have five, but it could be three, could be seven, could be nine and so on. As I said, five is always the best number. Five is usually the number that uh, we are most comfortable with uh, dealing. More than five colors, it starts getting a bit confusing to distinguish the various areas. So usually five colors, all of complementary um, nature, therefore hues of color, which when put together in any combination are easily distinguishable is really important. At the same time, also keep in mind the luminosity. So we have very light luminosity here, very dark. This is really important for uh, uh, color blindness. So although here it's not very clear, all of these color combinations have different luminosities. And by offering colors with different luminosities, you'll also have 100% assurance that color blind people will be able to easily read your illustrations. And in regards to luminosity, of course, this links us to the contrast of images. So this is not only colorblind people, everyone sees contrast and contrast is one of the most important cues together with color to make specific parts of the image pop as much as possible. Of course, white and black, as you can see in this example, work best. Uh, this is why I was saying figures in white and black usually should be used, but also gradient colors tend to um, react differently depending on the background. And similarly to photography, again, I don't want to repeat myself too much, but a lot of the times it's case specific. Therefore, always try to use stroke lines or uh, line colors, which are of a color complementary or contrasting with the background, but of course, uh, adjusting will be necessary for each case. So to give you an example of this uh, use of contrast, I have made a really quick image. As you can see, this is an image that could be easily published uh, anywhere as it has all the basic information. Everything is in black and white. There is a very good contrast with the background. However, it has a lot of elements. So we have not only the icons, we don't only have the tags, we also have the background boxes, the shadows of the background boxes, and we have behind these letters a square to help the contrast. So what could be done to make this image equally as legible yet easier to read? Of course, we could start by removing all the boxes. Black works just as well. But at the same time, we can bring this up a step further. And this is the step that I was talking about when I talk about experimenting, about playing around with the object, seeing what works and what doesn't. For example, in this case, just by changing the color of the icon background or the icon color and putting the number within it, we're not only putting together information in a more efficient way, since the number is not in the corner anymore, but it's within the animal itself, but we're also making it pop more. We're making it even more obvious. But sometimes it doesn't work as well, as you can see from the second. So in this case, it would be just as easy to change it back to the simple black image. So of course, Contrast is important. We talked about color. And the next step to consider is the size of the stroke and text. As I previously said, you always have to start 
uh, an artboard in this case with specific size in mind. But just like each journal has specific sizes of artboards and figures, each journal has set ranges for stroke and character sizes. So it's always really important to double check everything, especially because a simple minor difference in stroke size might have to be changed after the paper gets accepted and actually changing all the stroke sizes and character sizes might require you to redo the images from the grounds up basically. So it's always important, really important to double check and make sure that all the figures are legible. So if you can, and you have a figure for a publication, make sure to print it true to size if the publication is um, in printed format and you'll thank yourself many times later. To give you an example of uh, stroke and text sizes, this is a two euro coin, uh, standard coin size, but you can see the lines on the left and the words on the right, which are true to size to the coin, how actually small they are. Uh, it's very easy when doing any kind of design or illustration on the computer to zoom in and everything will be just as clear as, uh, as you want. However, a 0 0.25 point, which is almost never accepted by journals, which is also very commonly used by myself too, because it simply looks cleaner many times, it's, it's simply too thin to be printed. So always keep in mind these aspects and always, of course, keep in mind how big the uh, figure is. Columns are something that are common in uh, archeological journals. It can be a one column, one and a half or double column figure. And the column figure is not only important for the very beginning when you start the artboard and you start creating your figure, but it's also important when having in mind a multi-figure composition. Many of the times uh, figures used in scientific publications are not just one map or not just one photograph or not just one design. Usually they encompass a variety of aspects, whether it be different plots, uh, whether it be a regional map and a local map. So when putting these together, the first rule is to never overcrowd. By not overcrowding, you're giving the opportunity to the reader to still uh, manage to understand as much as possible from the figure. And of course, you can create a multi-figure composition within different types that I've created, so to speak, while uh, experimenting, which are recurrent and eccentric. To give you a visual representation of this, recurrent, you'll have it on the left, eccentric on the right. Uh, of course, the column type will uh, make these uh, types different, but very simply, they give the reader different ways of reading the final composition. More recurrent, very similar to any writing style, will lead the eye from horizontal, then vertical reading, horizontal and vertical, as you can see, or in single column, simply vertical. Eccentric is a much more organic type of reading, and it'll be dependent on what you use. So recurrent is very commonly used for any type of quantitative data. Uh, let's say you have a chronological graph or uh, different plots of multivariable analyses or any repetition or comparable graphs. That's the kind of type of composition you'll want to use so that you can equally compare each section with another without uh, making the reader confused. Eccentric, on the other hand, is very useful for qualitative data. So maps, for example, as I was saying, with a regional map, smaller, and the local map or site map having it much bigger, or you could have it for stratigraphies, landscapes, and so on. What is really important in regards to the eccentric is the, I found the best thing that works for eccentric is to always have images that get smaller in size. So having two images of the same size does not give the same flow as the images you're seeing with a bigger one than one that's much smaller, one that's smaller, smaller, and so on. So this is something that might help you with the uh, figure composition process. 
to give some example of these two types, so to give you a perspective of what they can look like, this is a, um, these are lithic drawings I did, and you could easily read this as a recurrent image. So all the lithics are in line by rows, and you can easily compare one to the other as the structure is exactly the same. Of course, the sizes of, are different, but you can compare it with one another. Another example is this. So these are simply different plots analyzing different variables within the same data set. And this very repetitive structure gives you opportunity to easily go from one uh, sector to another and compare the data directly. But of course, what if we had a map such as this case? Well, here we have an eccentric format. So we start with a much bigger regional map. See this as a figure for a literature review, for example. So we have a very big map with, uh, uh, with West Africa. We have some sites plot on it, then right under it, we have the list of the sites with some information about them. Then on the left, we have a more local map, which is linked again to the main map. And finally, we have the legend. So the circular motion is meant to tell a story and it's meant to help the reader understand better. Similar example, we have this. So this is a, it's a work in progress, but you have the main map in the upper right. Hopefully you'll see that the map in the lower right, that's much smaller. It's simply a repetition of that showing different data. And then you have other sets of data connecting to it. Therefore, keeping the reader interested, keeping the reader uh, uh, interested in reading and discovering more bits and pieces of the figure while still giving a story behind it and not losing data information or making it too crowded. Once again, these figure compositions can also be used in non-publication purposes. This is an example from a, um, uh, <coughs> excuse me, from a press release. And this is where I used for um, a work I recently published, which is a methodological, uh, methodological paper showing the drawing process behind the Steva method. It's showing in a circle connected by this line, the first, second, third, and so on steps until the final seventh step, which is the figure. And this is meant you to understand each step and understand the whole method without even reading one word. So hopefully this gives you an understanding of how different compositions can help the reader understand different stories and different sets of data. But what is important is not only the single figure or the single composition, but it's also how different compositions and different figures link with one another. So the idea of consistency that I already touched on, as we can see here on this article that's cur currently in preparation, we see this image. Uh, we can describe it very simply. It's two different plans of a cave. Uh, the image is eccentric. It uses just four colors. So it uses white, it uses black, it uses this red that's used for this little square and it uses the blue for the water. The strokes are all consistent. The smaller stroke is 0 0.75 true to size. And other, another uh, figure on this manuscript is this one here. You've already seen it. Again, eccentric, as we can see, very similar in style. The font is the same. And again, all the colors are the same. Going one step further, these are some other figures from the same publication. As you can see, even the most minor details, such as the scale style, are all the same. And the North Arrow are, are all the same. This is meant to help the reader go through the figures and go through the paper without losing attention or without wasting time by keeping the same colors consistent and linking them to similar aspects of each figure will give the opportunity to the reader to catch faster what we're trying to tell them and hopefully making them understand the paper better. 
So, of course, finally, you can get photographs, you can get design, you can get illustration, put it together in a single image. So here we have a composition. We have a good contrast between whites and blacks. Uh, we have, starting from the very beginning, a, an artifact which has been properly cropped. It's on a black background, therefore we can see everything really well. We have details that we want to show better, therefore we include uh, micrographs or microscope photos to it. And to this, of course, we include an eccentric style so that you're first directed to the center of it, which is the major composition. And then you'll start looking at each individual image, usually in a circular motion. On the other side, we have a recurrent illustration. Of course, you will see that it's always the same artifact. And here, of course, the caption is missing. We don't have um, explanation of the marks, but again, it's very simple doesn't have too many colors, straightforward, and it's consistent with the whole composition from even the smallest details, such as the letters continuing between the two. So that said, I hope these examples give you a good idea of what can be done and how uh, different elements of design and photography and illustration can be put together to make legible and hopefully easy to make figures. And the last point I would like to talk about is this final concept of beautifying archaeology. So what makes a figure efficiently communicate data while still being attractive? Um, there is to say, uh, I've heard this many times, that figures are the first thing that people look at, especially when dealing with publications and press releases. A figure is uh, objective, it's not only to uh, explain the study or explain a specific concept or show some data, but a figure it's also meant to tie in the reader, let them understand what the paper is about without having to read anything but the title. And it must interest the reader enough that they will then read the rest of it. So the figures itself, the uh, idea of the images within a paper itself not only have to communicate data, but they also have to be attractive. And this is done with two very simple aspects. As we already said, the simplicity of the images is uh, really important. Many times looking at a figure that's too complicated, you could even be scared by it rather than fascinated by it. And that is definitely not a good thing. So images have to be easy to follow. They must have really simple colors. They have to be straightforward and they must be strong in contrast. If you have these three aspects, you're assured that your image is simple enough to be captivating. And at the same time, of course, balance is fundamental. So both within a figure, but also all the figures of a paper, the strokes and text sizes have to be coherent and a thoughtful composition is required. So I hope that by explaining all these uh, concepts, giving you practical and theoretical perspectives, you'll see how much scientific imaging is not only important, but how it can actually make the science a better communicator. The final objective of this presentation, at least, is to share with all of you all these uh, simple, hopefully, concepts and simple tools that I've developed to make an image effective. And of course, at the same time, I'm hoping to share this opinion of mine that figures are at times or most of the times the most important part of a paper, especially when we're taking into account scientific literature as a means of science communication and spreading the data of our discoveries and our information and our theories. And a good figure makes a lot of difference 
while a not so good looking figure at times can actually be damaging. So of course, uh, I hope that everything was clear and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. First, I would like to thank Irini again for inviting me. I would like to thank the PhD committee and the Department of Archaeology at Leiden for making this possible. And I would like to thank, finally, Michela Lunardi from the University of Cambridge and Emily Hallett from the PANIF project here at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History for giving me permission to share some of their material, their data, and their analyses. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Jacopo. Uh, very nice talk. I think that uh, you really covered almost everything uh, briefly, but that's okay that you gave a very good overview without uh, staying in some things uh, too long or too little in some other things. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, we, re we are recording this uh, talk so people can always go back and pause the video at some points. Uh, you were explaining where to find uh, the tools uh, in, Illustrate, in Illustrator or in Photoshop. So I think uh, if someone is doing this practically, they can always go back and slowly follow the things and then use the buzzwords um, of the terms and find additional YouTube uh, videos. So I find it very, very useful. So thank you very much for coming and doing this year and for, for agreeing to record it. Absolutely. Uh, so yes, we are, you, you finished within an hour. <laughs> so we do have a lot of time for questions. Uh, I would like uh, to ask people either to type uh, the question in the chat or uh, to raise their hand. Now, I'm not sure if I see everyone. Um, Yes, but I can ask, I can start with uh, some questions uh, I have, or one question. Mm -hmm. uh, so one question I practically had uh, once uh, about the publication and the photography is, uh, well, I know that you're supposed to describe the type of camera and lens you're using, uh, for, for example, the images uh, mm -hmm. or the documentation, even if it's not necessarily a very, uh, yeah. Like for example, if I take images of the stratigraphy because I'm not taking images of artifacts, so I don't know really what you do in that case, but in mm -hmm. my case, uh, you need uh, to add the camera uh, specifications, but how much detail do you need? So regarding this, um, given the methodology uses usually, or at least the description of this methodological aspect usually goes into supplementary information mm. or it goes towards the end of a paper, usually it's not really um, controlled or uh, requested. There is no level of detail requested usually. What I would say is that from someone that uses this information quite often and someone that does this, I would say to always go with as much detail as you can, simply because it's the detail that's recorded. It's something that once you've published it and put it on paper, might give the opportunity to other researchers to learn from it. So to give a more um, specific example, in your case, for example, with stratigraphy photographs, I would personally put a camera model, lens model and focal length of the camera lens. Um, what else, any extra equipment if you used any. Mm, so the example, use of- a tripod. Yeah, Could tripod, be. lighting, yeah. Uh, basically anything that you use. It's always better to write more than less. And plus it gives other researchers the opportunity to um, see that you're actually being very proactive and you're being as thorough as you can. So also from a reviewing perspective, 
this is usually uh, appreciated. Yeah. And also another thing uh, for the specific photos, many of the times it's something that we don't even realize, but uh, when we take photos from, of, from any camera, the settings of the single photo are recorded in the metadata of the photograph. So f-stops, aperture, uh, shutter time, they're all within the photograph. So if you even want within a specific section of the SI, it's always good to put a photo from figure three. This is the f-stop, this is the aperture, this is this, this is that. I mean, it's there, it's an easy copy and paste. Yeah, very, there you go. <laughs> very thorough indeed. Okay, thank you. Of course. Uh, so, uh, Renata, uh, may, maybe you want to ask your question. You can unmute yourself or also open the camera if you want or not. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I uh, thank you a lot for the very instructive lecture. Um, I'm working with uh, 3D modeling and um, uh, I have to do some models of um, uh, bifacial points uh, using photogrammetry. And I would like to ask you uh, something about the background that I need to set uh, in order to take a good photo and have it in harmony with the object uh, I'm, focus, I'm focusing on. So like, um, what is a good um, background settling for, um, for, lithic, uh, for lithic artifacts? Because um, sometimes I, uh, I used in the past a kind of um, grid that I just printed and put it like uh, on, the, the, on, the on the turntable and then the object on top of it. But some people uh, have already told me like it, it would be good to have some little objects to have them as a, as a reference uh, for, the, for the software I'm gonna use uh, later to process all the, the, the model. So do you have any, any hints for photogrammetry for the, for the background setting? So yes, um, but first let me ask you just one question. Uh, do you want to create 3D models with a uh, texture? So with a yeah. color? Okay. Yes. Okay. So I would say the most important thing in your case would be not the backgrounds, but the lighting. And that by that, I mean, uh, backgrounds sometimes can give problems because of shadows or changes in lighting. So the background should generally be similar to photography, therefore a color that's complementary to your find. So if, for example, your biface point is uh, dark in color, black, you'd want white. If uh, it's lighter in color, a yellowish, you could try with a, a dark red or you could try with uh, a black. But what you want is to have the background of the same exact tone of color. And that can be done with uh, lighting. So you either use a light box or put, that's what we would usually use with photogrammetry, put it in a light box and put lights at the two side ends and one at the top. Or mm -hmm. if a light box is not available at the time, simply get lamps and put opaque paper, like tracing paper right on top of it. Oh, okay. Uh, tracing paper? What, what uh, do you mean by it? It's the... Uh, it's the semi-transparent paper. So it's whitish and you can see through it. It's used for illustration. All right, okay, I know and, what you mean. Mm -hmm. And put it in front of a light, it gives an extremely suffused light that does not create shadows. Okay, and, and is this like, uh, can, I, can I have the same, can I use the same uh, things like concerning the light? Uh, can I have the same um, lightning for, uh, just photos for for publications like photos from if i had if i want to take all the scars and and show all the sides of uh of my object um is it recommendable to um use lights in all points yes yes okay absolutely and not it's, only it's, one right yeah it's exactly the same setup 
the only difference would be the angle of the camera simply because mm -hmm. you would want the camera at the top for a photograph if you were going to do a single face at a time but either way like the setup of the lighting is exactly the same because you just want a light that will show the lithic scars well enough from every single angle okay okay that, that's very helpful thanks thanks a lot absolutely uh lighting is fundamental so that's <laughs> That's a that's a take a take at home message, and the the more you play with it, the better it'll be, for sure. Okay, thank you very much. Of course. Uh, we have another question um, by Bogdan in the chat. Uh, would you use RTI on a regular basis to be sure you have the right lighting shading of the artifacts? beside the 3D aspect of the technique, of course. So RTI is not something that uh, I've used very much. What, uh, so the problem I've, I've encountered with RTI um, is it takes a lot of control to move the light at different angles. So what it basically is, it's, uh, by having a stationary camera and putting light at different angles. This is for the people that never heard about it. You put the light at different angles and take photos of that. And then you post process it. So to have an image with complete images, uh, complete um, uh, quality and resolution of what you're trying to portray. So apart from the 3D aspects, technique, I would say it's really useful for the 3D aspect technique, but I don't think I would use RTI on a regular basis for the simple reason that uh, it's easier to just find the right lighting for an object or an artifact and take one photo than moving the light for several photos and taking several photos and then processing them into one. So what I would say is if you intend to then make a 3D model out of the object, or you think you might, you should go with RTI. But if you are intending just to do the artifact photo, uh, it's, it's not really worth it. I hope that makes sense. Uh, thank you. Uh, maybe uh, Bogdan, if you have any more, if, if the question covered you, can you please? Uh... Say, yeah, <laughs> say so. Yes, okay, <laughs> so great. Uh, well, thank you for the question. <laughs> so we have one more question mm -hmm. from Diane. Uh, do you have any ideas <laughs> about the technique to take artifacts, pictures on the field? Sometimes it's very difficult because of too much exposure of the sun. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, um, Based on my experience, uh, so let's let's do a two part. The first one, artifact photos in the fields, which I think you were uh, talking more about, like bigger pictures, so stratigraphies and so on. But artifacts, usually going into a room or using a cardboard box, uh, it can be easily be dealt with. Also using a, a coat or a hoodie and putting the lithic on a background on the ground. In regards, however, to uh, site photos, so just artifacts within sites, it's more complicated and you'd have to use big, uh, uh, big sheets of material. We'd use big cloth materials to cover a larger area. So ideally you want shadow for either case you want shadow if you can take the artifacts in this case to a closed environment that would be best if not uh, a closed environment cardboard box uh, wheelbarrow a coat anything that will create shadow and a little trick for this that works really well with artifacts if for example you put the artifact in a cardboard box but the light is not good enough uh, what you can do is get a uh, light deflecting object. It can be a little mirror or it can be just a metal piece 
and deflect the light so to make a sort of uh, field produced uh, light box. But it, it takes a bit of, of working around and shadow is the number one thing and then finding the right angle of the artifact and the camera. Hope that helps. Thank you. I, I think uh, it's fine. I also have one more question, sure. uh, a quick one. It's about the color coders. Yes. Uh, I also have some color coder uh, and coders, uh, a black, a white, and a gray one. So I'm always wondering, do I have to choose one color or do I just put all of them? Um, so for color coders, usually what you really want is uh, white. So the monochromatic ones are usually what all you really need. So white, gray, and black, ideally, or just white and black usually works. Um, and that basically what it does, it's called a color coder, but it doesn't really recolor the image. What it does is it changes the luminosity of the image. So by having a white, gray, and black, you're not really selecting the colors as much as you're selecting the tone. So you're having a really light color, a mid-tone color, and a dark tone color. Hence, using those three. If we looked back at, I'm just going to give you an example. So if we look back at photography, if we look back at this image, effectively the image on the left and the image on the right are the same colors. They're the same hues of colors. They're just on the right, it's just lighter in color. So to answer your question, black, uh, black, gray, and white is all you need. If you want to go one step further, however, you can use the colors. For, usually you use the colors that are the most important for you. For example, in this case, I would use uh, yellow just because it's the closest color. But generally, you don't use colors uh, simply because the colors in the color coders, they're used for photography. And in that, those cases, for example, if you take the photo of a red flower, you would use a red color coder because you want the red of the flower to be the same red as your color coder. So it's more of a um, distortion you're doing to the colors rather than a fixing of it. I hope that makes sense. Yes, thank you. Uh, there is one more question yep. by Carlos. Uh, so uh, he has a problem uh, because he's starting to take first photos of hand axes to make the diacritical drawings in Illustrator. I don't have much experience with photography but there is the problem of certain parts of the piece being blurry. How can I sol solve that? So thank you for uh, asking this question because it's something I should have talked about. So your problem comes from one specific function in the camera. So it's good that you've asked because it's really simple to fix. So it's about aperture. So as I said, aperture, the difference in aperture gives you the opportunity to uh, have a different depth of field. A depth of field is simply how much of your view is in focus. So shallower depth of field means that very little gets in focus. So if the lens is looking downwards, shallower depth of field means that very little is in focus. The larger depth of field, it means that more is in focus. So the problem you're probably having is that a simple object, so with a camera up here, your depth of field probably only looks at the very top and the bottom becomes blurry. So what you want to do is to make the depth of field larger, and that is done by making the aperture smaller. So what you have to do is set your camera to either aperture setting or manual setting 
and changing your aperture to a smaller one. Usually just going from one step to another, so from a two to a 2.8 works, but just try and making it smaller and see which one looks best. This should completely solve your problems of uh, focus. However, keep in mind that by modifying the aperture here, you're also modifying the light sensitivity. So in this case, for example, you're making the depth of field larger. So you're making the lens more light sensitive. So if you increase the aperture, you have to decrease either the ISO or the time. So just play around with these three. I would personally suggest to decrease the time because it's not a digital function like ISO and it keeps the image uh, neater. So what I would suggest, decrease the size of aperture and decrease the time and the image should be absolutely fine. Thank you. Can I ask uh, just one question uh, quickly? Um, so uh, to get, if I understand, uh, preferably uh, use a smaller F value, that's it? Exactly. Okay, uh, but I didn't understand what the, um, the, the timer, um, I know they are the ISO and the F, but uh, I didn't get what is the, the name of the function that we use to control the, the time so that so I can. Of course, so the, sorry, I didn't say this. At the time is, it depends on the camera you have. Usually it's either time value <coughs> or it's shutter speed. So you will see it in one of these two names and usually it goes from fractions of seconds so 132 to several seconds. What I usually do for lithics is have a really um, high aperture. So like a really high depth of field and have a really long exposure time. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Of course. Uh, okay. So uh, thank you for answering all the questions. Uh, I don't see any more questions. Uh, so I think I will stop recording now. Uh, do you want to stop?